Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this Ag Forecast for South America, brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. I'd like to take a moment here and just do a look back on the December through mid-January total precipitation. So there are about 43 days in this map here of satellite-derived precipitation. Now, as you look at the map, we can see that across parts of Mato Grosso, over toward Tocantins, this is Goyas, Minas Gerais, and Bahia. There are regions in here that saw better than 24 inches of rain. That's where the whites come in here. So very, very heavy rainfall, generally speaking, 16 to 24 inches of rain north. The regions we've been most concerned about, southern parts of Mato Grosso do Sul, through Parna, Rio Grande do Sul, both Paraguay and Uruguay, and pockets throughout Argentina. Now to assess that region of drought, which we've done using the USDA data, we've looked at the CHIRPS data set, but let's just now look at satellite derived information. I'm gonna get rid of all the precipitation amounts on this map that are above two inches. So what we're gonna identify now in color is any region that's seen below two inches of precipitation in the last 43 days. So now you start to see these regions, Mato Grosso do Sol, Parna, Santa Catarina, Rio Grande do Sol, big section here along the Paraná River over toward Cordoba, back into Paraguay and Uruguay. So that's the area that has received less than two inches of total precipitation as measured by satellite going back uh, over the last 43 days. So that kind of gives us a hint on the extent of this drought area. Now what we need to do with this is we need to compare this to our production maps, right? So we look at the soybean production maps from the USDA and I'm just going to trust that these are, are relatively accurate. And I start to see that, you know, this region right over here, I mean, go back and look at this. That's an area that has seen over two feet of rainfall during this time period. And that's a very productive region right over here between Bahia, uh, Goyas, and Tocantins and through this area. Mato Grosso, of course, uh, decently heavy precipitation, but we just add this up, okay, from Parna with 16%, Rio Grande do Sol 16%, Mato Grosso do Sol 8%. We're talking about... 40% of the crop down here to the south that has seen the moisture stress. And this continues into Argentina and, of course, Paraguay and Uruguay. Now, as we look at this upcoming week's forecast, let's just distill down what the next seven days looks like uh, compared to the climatological average. I'll show you this in a few moments, but there will be a frontal boundary stalling out in this area. Now, let me get you oriented here. Mato Grosso do Sol is there. Here's Mato Grosso getting over to Brazil's eastern growing regions. Now to the north, the drier weather that we see here overall is going to be a net positive. There's going to be rapid harvest in this area, the first crop soybeans, and getting some of the drier conditions in place here without yet seeing the extreme heat in that region is going to be beneficial for also planting the safrina crop, which is mostly a corn and cotton crop. Now, the latest model updates, 12Z runs today on Thursday, did bring in a little bit better, more scattered rain into Parana, which is this state here. But the heaviest rains are down here in southern Mato Grosso, or excuse me, southern Rio Grande do Sol over into northern Argentina. We have scattered storms that'll be here to the south over the very dry regions of Cordoba, getting back into Uruguay. So very narrow corridor here over the next seven days of getting this heavier precipitation coming through. So again, we're just gonna go over some reasoning as to why this is happening. I wanna talk first about the transition that's happening south of South America. It has a lot to do with what's called the Antarctic Oscillation or the Southern Annular Mode. Now we've shown you this quite a bit lately. It's been very positive up until just recently where the forecast is now to take this over the next few days down to average or even below average before popping back up here again. So while this is not a long-term shift in the AAO behavior where it's been way up here for so long and now it's expected to come down here and stay, okay, we do have this temporary dip down here to normal, even below normal Antarctic oscillation values. Now what does that mean? Whenever we see this coming down, this just tends to promote deeper troughs getting farther to the north, pushing their fronts to the north. That's it. That's all that it's, this is really standing for here. We're pushing more of those troughs farther to the north. And you can see it. Ready? This animation you're about to watch here is showing you pressure anomalies uh, through the next several days. So getting out here Friday and working our way into the weekend, do you see how much of Brazil's northern and eastern growing areas are going to be on the positive side of the pressure anomaly, which means higher pressures dominating? But we're now starting to see those troughs come through, producing the areas of low pressure, which are increasing the ability to get the air to rise. And as we work our way into Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, that's the region in through there 
that's being affected by that upcoming front that's going to pass through. And that's going to be the area we're going to watch and see throughout early next week at getting the best chance of adding some more precipitation into this area. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you. The models do a terrible job just because of the convective nature of the storms and the low resolution of the models on telling you exactly where the heaviest rain is going to be, which means we know it's going to be in this corridor, but we have to wait and watch it from satellite, from the local radar network, and then get the data afterward to see who got the rain and who didn't get the rain. But I'm going to tell you, before that gets here, as we saw today and then as we press into the day on Friday, look at this. High temperatures here are way up in the upper 30s into the low 40s Celsius. So we're going to have another day here of, of near triple digit heat stress in this region. And just remember, this is adding to what has been a very hot and dry time period in this part of Argentina, getting into southern Brazil. So that's working the day through Friday. And when that front starts to come through, there we go. We get a little bit of a view of it. This is Saturday, right in through there. That's where the front will be on Saturday. And then through Sunday, there you go. The front's pushing farther to the north by the afternoon temperatures on Sunday. So we're still getting the heat in here to the north of that. But that front then slides north and takes the heat with it. See this? It pushes into Paraguay at that point where we get into those upper 30s, lower 40s in terms of high temperatures. And after that, working away to next Tuesday, and then out here to next Wednesday, it's mainly Paraguay that's going to be taken on the brunt of the heat as that front gets established. So we go from there, and we also start to build in the other part of this picture. I think a lot of it has to do with some shifting around of the MJO. We do see the MJO, see this, these, these uh, negative velocity potentials? We see it coming out over here and sticking around in this area. And that means that in the near term, we've got a lot of subsidence in the upper levels of the atmosphere over much of northern Brazil. I think that's a part of this overall story, but I'm going to add to that in a few moments. And what you end up getting, again, bigger picture is this, but let's now walk through and see how much precipitation the models are going to be producing. So as we play through the day on Friday and working our way towards Saturday, getting into Sunday. Sunday is when the front gets far enough north that we get some scatter storms over Buenos Aires, pushing into the uh, Paraná River Valley here, and then into Uruguay. According to the models, they've been pretty consistent with this. There's gonna be some scattered showers ahead of that that show up over, Par and storms, by the way, that show up over Paraná and Sao Paulo, right? Now, as we keep playing this forward into early next week, this is Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, getting out toward Thursday. You see the models are most aggressive right in through here at bringing in the heaviest precipitation. And while that hits a substantial portion of this region, you know, we needed to spread more of this rain farther to the south and farther back into Buenos Aires and Argentina to relieve more of that drought. It's got to get farther to the north into more of Parna and into Paraguay and into Mato Grosso do Sul. That's regions that have been in drought as well. So based off of just a rough calculation of this total drought area, we're returning good rains to about half of it. I think we're returning good rains to about half of that total drought area uh, by the time we get out to next Friday. But you can see there could be some locally heavy amounts in this region. Now the models want to take this and leave that same pattern in place getting out there beyond that time period, uh, getting out here into week two. The latest update now from the European model continues to keep drier conditions north in Mato Grosso and above average precipitation south in parts of Argentina and pockets in southern Brazil. And then this is what's really interesting about this because that gets us almost to the end of the month of January. As we look out there to mid-February, the models, the European is very aggressive on keeping south of that line, which is a substantial portion. We would probably call that 80% of South America's growing areas for corn, soybeans, and cotton keeping this whole region quite wet. Now, I've really been calling this into question quite a bit as to whether or not it will really look quite like this. And I wanna give you some multi-model evidence as to why I'm, I'm still very suspicious on it being uh, as wet as the models are forecasting through this entire area going into the middle part of February. That's a 30-day window uh, into early parts of, of February. And my reason for that is if I just switch this over to the GFS extended, it's actually much drier in this area and it's keeping the wetter conditions farther to the south where they are right now. Now, coming back to the European Ensemble, which goes out longer, I can keep playing this window out. Let's just look at the entire month of February. 
and it's trying to keep a region in through here quite wet. And I'm trying to ask myself, are we going to be seeing this northern and central growing area really showing up this wet? So I did some analysis using the ERA-5 data, that's a European model data set, and I reconstructed a time series for the month of February over Mater Grosso right here. And I looked for these dry years. I just plucked off these dry years and started to ask some questions about it. So here's some of the things we discovered, right? First of all, the flow of the monsoon shifts. You see, these are what the low level wind vectors look like when it's dry in Brazil's northern growing areas in February. The flow tends to come around like that. Now, what's the difference? Normal monsoonal flow doesn't originate here. It tends to come out of the ITCZ, out of this area around the equator, pulls around here, and then it's met with fronts coming up from the south. That's the typical monsoonal flow pattern just like that. So you see how anomalous it is around this big high pressure cell here? That would be the first thing we'd have to see setting up right in this area. Now, are we gonna see that? Well, it turns out that those years that have drier Februarys do have residual cold water that's here uh, in Nina region one plus two. And also notice this, there's a pretty strong signal for colder water in this area. What we have right now is not yet that full picture. We've got the east focused La Nina, but certainly have warm anomalies in place here, largely because of where the southern annular motor, the Antarctic Oscillation, has been sending its strongest winds farther to the south. We've just not cooled this off as a result. So that's a bit of a mixed bag when looking at what February could be in this area. But I got a little bit more analysis for you. The MJO. You see, the MJO needs to basically be between uh, be between phase four and out here toward phase seven and eight and spend a lot of time north of Australia, over Indonesia, you know, this particular region. It's got to have a lot of ascent happening in this area, not over the Indian Ocean and certainly not over, you know, the far western Pacific, which means we really need to see if this is going to go dry in this area, we'd have to see the MGO really spending a lot of time in phase four or five. And we know that historically, because in, throughout this time period, phase four and phase five, and even over into phase six, tends to be drier. Now, is it going to do that? Do we have a strong enough signal? And this is what really makes me call into question the long range European forecast, is this is what we've got right now from the European. It's saying, well, over the next several days, sure, stay in phase seven, curl back around into it. But if it were to do this, if it were to come out and pop out into phase five, or pop out into phase four in a big way, that would be a very dry signal for much of Brazil's northern and central growing areas. But we just don't have a clear picture from the model just yet. There's another part to this as well. Normally when northern Brazil goes over dry, so I'm talking Mato Grosso, getting to the eastern growing areas, Argentina tends to be quite wet. We tend to have lower pressure south and higher pressure north. And that happens when you start to get these deeper troughs moving into Argentina, pulling that those fronts north and giving all that rain. High pressure develops here and shuts down, which means we would need to see the Antarctic Oscillation go negative. We need to see more of those troughs bringing in the precipitation to Argentina and southern Brazil if northern Brazil is going to go dry. Now, at this point, as you see all these pieces coming together, if they're not fitting together for you yet, that's right, they're not. I'm not seeing constructive interference or I'm not seeing deconstructive interference with any of this yet, which makes me ultimately call into question these forecasts, not that one, this one. I am, I'm going to watch carefully to try to understand, could we truly get a corridor in here on some drought-stricken ground that goes over very, very wet in the month of February? Or do we see more dry conditions pull down from the north and wetter over parts of Argentina? Both scenarios are in play, and I'm not going to even attempt to make a, you know, a guess, because that's all it would be, as to which is going to be the most dominant. We do not have clear enough signals. What I do know right now is rain is coming into some places, hitting about 50% of that drought area. Will it be completely corrective and revive the crop? No, it can't. We've done too much damage to that crop in place. And the second thing we know is this has been a pretty good signal, at least through the end of January, keeping Brazil's northern growing areas dry and better chances of rain through Argentina moving forward. 
So that's what I've got for you, my latest analysis. Thanks for giving me a little bit extra time tonight on Thursday night to get this out to you. I was driving home uh, from uh, from Kentucky and got in some thick fog here in Illinois. But uh, hopefully this gives you uh, some perspective on what we're watching. I'll talk to you again very soon. Thank you.